Good evening. It is great to have everybody with us this evening uh, for our Wednesday night Bible study. We're going through the book of Mark. If you'd like to open your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Mark chapter 5. We uh, finished up chapter 4 last week, so we're on now to the healing of the man with many unclean spirits. Well, as uh, we've gotten together this way, we we have been able to also come together on Sunday here at the building. If uh, you've not felt comfortable doing that yet, or if you, uh, for whatever reason, if you haven't come together with us yet, we uh, want you to still know that we love you, we appreciate you, we miss you, and and uh, each one of you is always in our prayers. Well, tonight, before we begin our study, I'd like to have a word of prayer. Our God and our Father, we thank you so much for all that you've given us. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the very breath of life within us. God, we thank you for all the, the ways that you work in our lives and the ways that you, you bless us that maybe we don't take time to recognize. Well, God, as we look into your word tonight, we truly, truly appreciate the blessing that it is. We pray that as we read these, these accounts of, of all that your son has done, that we understand, that we take them to heart, and that we live more like him every day. Father, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, Mark chapter 5. We're starting in a place called Gerasenes. It is on the east side of the Jordan. The name seems to be of, of Hebrew origin. But at the time of Jesus, it was no longer under control of the Israelites. It was actually, it had been taken over by the Syrians. It was occupied by them, but at least under Solomon, and we're not, I wasn't exactly clear on when it, it left, but under Solomon, that was part of his kingdom. But by the time of Jesus' ministry, it was not. This is important, well, because there's pigs in this story, and you're not going to hear a lot about pigs in, in the Old or the New Testament. But because there's pigs and because we see uh, an account of Jesus caring for the Gentiles. So tonight as we start this off, I'd, I'd like to go ahead and <clears throat> read verses 1 through 5. Matthew, or Mark, sorry, chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. It says, They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. He had often been bound with shackles and chains, but wrenched the chains apart and broke the shackles into pieces. No one had strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and mountains, he, always, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Mm. Uh, as you start reading commentaries and some of the... <laughs> The, the smart guys, there's actually some dispute as to uh, where this was, but really not that much dispute. It's, it's pretty simple. It's the other side from the places where he was healing and teaching. So it's, it's on the east side of the, of the Sea of Galilee. The east side gets us to this other country. <laughs> he had left the land of the Hebrew people and had gone into a foreign country, the country of Gerasenes. And so, you know, we, like I said, some of the scholars, I think, sometimes outthink themselves. But this was, seems pretty simple because of what happened before this, which was Jesus calming the storm 
as they were crossing the Sea of Galilee, they came to the other side. They were on the west side, which was still controlled by, by the Israelites. It was still Hebrew land, but this was not. This was actually Syria. And so when he got to the other side, he was in this foreign country. It's unclear exactly why he went here, because he didn't seem to go out of his way to, to uh, go to the Gentiles. There were times when Gentiles came to him, but this was a case where he went out of, well, the land to which he, he had initially gone. So anyway, he went into this foreign country. Verses two through four says, and when Jesus stepped out of the boat immediately, there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, broke the shackles into pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Who lives in a graveyard? Why would you live literally in the tombs? Why would you live in these tombs? Well, it was most likely the only refuge for someone who was an outcast of the society to the point that he was. He couldn't even be bound. If they could bind him, if they could subdue him, they could have kept him in the city or close to the city at least. But as it turns out, if he was by the sea in the city that we're, we'll be talking about is several miles. So there's a, yeah, when we get to that point, we realize that when he couldn't be bound, when he broke chains and he busted the shackles apart, when he overpowered everyone, I think Mark is, is by Holy Spirit inspiration, trying to impress upon us the, the strength the superhuman strength that we're dealing with with this man. Now, superhuman strength or no pain signals, or did the demon overpower him and even though he felt the pain, do it anyway? You see, we've had a lot of stories already about Jesus casting out unclean spirits, casting out evil spirits. He was taking care of these, these demon-possessed people. This is the most in-depth by far. It seems to be the most interaction that Jesus had with, in, in any kind of case like this. But with all of the answers that we get, of course, with my mind, it brings up more questions. I don't know if it was a strength. I don't know if it was because he wasn't feeling pain or even though he felt pain, but the demons who were uh, in control actually forced his body to do it anyway. I, I don't know. I, I have such a, a lack of understanding in this because, you know, we don't deal with this. But we have a man who lived in the tombs, a man who was completely an outcast. We have a man who was absolutely uncontrollable and seem to be, this just looks like a lonely and miserable existence. It was, it was to the point where, where society had no place for him. It's a rough place to be. When verse five, it says night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Uh, the word there, your, your translation that you're using may say bruising himself. Um, we could talk about that, but I, I believe that cutting is probably a, a, an accurate translation of that. Night and day, he was just crying out in, in despair and agony, whatever. He was just crying out. Night and day, not a restful, not a peaceful existence. Where? Well, the tombs and the mountains, far away from, from society, from people, from friends, from loved ones, from family. What is 
this cutting himself or injuring himself with the stones. Well, it's not uncommon for people who are in deep, deep despair to do things like this. It's an outward manifestation of the incredible internal turmoil that they have. It's, it's an act of desperation. It's Again, it's crying out only with action rather than words. We're not clear as to whether he was living in a way where he was just divorced from reality or if he was just living under the control of an evil spirit and all the while aware of what was happening. We don't know, but to me, the crying out and the, the cutting himself, the injuring himself, that was a cry of a man who knew what was going on and could not stop it. He had no control. I've heard people who, who've done things like this and, and even that very thing. And most of the time they talk about control. They talk about a lack of control and uh, he literally had no control. So night and day he's, he's crying out. Night and day he's, he's cutting himself. He's in the tombs, he's, he's on the mountains, but he's never where we all need to be and that is with those whom we love and who love us. Verses six and seven, it says, and when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him and crying out with a loud voice, he said, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Ooh. Uh, we have those occasions where the, the demons would cry out. We have the occasions where the, the people with the unclean spirit would, would recognize him as, as Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But <laughs> this is a little different. This particular instance, there's a fear. He's just terrified and and brought to mind James 2.19, where it says, you believe God is one, you do well. The demons believe and shudder. I can't help but think that this is an occasion of, of the demons believing, shuddering, and confessing with, well, with the mouth of the one whom they're uh, in control of, the power of Jesus, the, the fear that they had of Jesus, the recognition. Now, this was not the man, but the demons who recognized Jesus and had control in this situation. He ran up to Jesus and he fell face down on the ground. That is a, it's the, the ultimate sign of submission. It's offering yourself to the one to whom you're bowing down. The whole, you know, little bow thing. Yeah, that's nice and it's a recognition, but this is an actual act of submission. Why? Because he wanted to fear God and keep his commandments? No, but there was a fear of torment. The man was being tormented but the demons were only concerned when they stood the chance, uh, when, when it affected them. I, hmm, I wonder if there's not a lesson in there. Well, verses 8 and 9 says, For he was saying to them, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he replied, Legion, for we are many. That is bone-chilling, frightening. The Roman legion had between four and 6,000 men. The obvious reference is this was a massive force of evil spirits within this man. The humanity of the man would have had to have been 
all but obscured by this massive occupying force within him. Uh, what's the old saying about sin? Sin will take you further down than you ever thought you would go and keep you longer than you ever intended to stay. This man was down. And this man had no hope at this point of returning. But the demons had a fear of torment. They had a fear uh, of being destroyed by Jesus. This is going to bring up a lot of questions later, but we'll, we'll get through the narrative first. But this man would have really looked like and acted like a wild beast instead of a man. But it wasn't him, it was the, the spirits within him. Like I said, <laughs> there's a lot of questions in this, but let's, uh, let's continue on and, and go through the narrative. Verses 10 through 12, it says, Now he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs. Let us enter them. Huh. Okay. The demons had power over this man, but they recognized Jesus' power over them. Rather than being cast out of the country, is the way that it was put here, the demon was bold enough to bargain with Jesus. I think that's significant because we don't see that in the others. This, this legion, this group, this whatever it was, this occupying force within this man felt the power in the numbers or perhaps the perception of power in, in the numbers that he had. Well, the question is, what's the lowest thing? What's the lowest living thing to a Jew? To a Jewish man? Jesus. Well, look, there's some pigs. Just let us enter into those pigs and leave this man so that we won't be destroyed, so that we won't be driven into arid places, so we won't be driven away and, and left. Well, The problem was they thought, well, here's a Jewish man. Here's some pigs. He won't care about that because he's a Jewish man. But the problem is that they were dealing with the creator God. Hebrews 1, 2 tells us that about, about Jesus, about the Son of God, that he is the creator God, not just a man of a certain image. That means he created those pigs. He knew there would be bacon. But he was the creator of all living things, and those pigs were something that he cared about because he was the creator God. Ah, uh, Where do the demons, where do the evil spirits go when they're cast out? Well, we can presume that it's out of this country. We can presume by some other scripture that driven out to to dwell in an arid place um but we don't know we don't know how it works we don't understand it all but of course we know jesus did so they were bargaining and they they begged to be put into these pigs well, in verse 13 he says so he gave them permission and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. They were saved and then they were lost all in a moment. There are lots of questions without answers about animals in demon possession now, right? Um, we don't know, we don't understand, but... That is 
you know, God loves all of his creation. And, and if he delivers the people, you think he probably delivers more than that. And they were saved. They were lost. We read about some who say the pig's suicide was unrelated to the, to the uh, demon possession. Really? The evil spirits had nothing to do with the pigs running off of that cliff. Well, the implication in the text here is that this is all tied together. That as soon as the evil spirits entered them, they ran off of the high place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So, yeah, it, to me, it's pretty clear. Jesus had no mercy on the demons, but he took the, it, the opportunity to demonstrate his power in an even more dramatic way. There were those who were watching. We'll see that. There were those who were there, and when they saw this, when they saw the evil spirits exit the man, enter the pigs, which... I guess it's something they could see, but that's a guess. But they saw that, they, they understood that that was happening, and then the pigs ran into the sea and drowned. And, well, their response was pretty, pretty human, pretty fleshly. In verse 14 and 15, it says, And the herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They were fearful. So these herdsmen, who obviously were tending the pigs, saw this happen, and they went to the country, they went to the city, they went all around and they were telling this story. There was a, you know, of course, this was something noteworthy to say the least, but they, they ran away after the pigs ran off the cliff. They fled. Now, they were probably thinking that that would be the most amazing moment, and they went to tell everyone, and then they came out. And the people came out, and what they saw was stranger than what they thought. It wasn't just a bunch of drowned pigs. This wild, naked, screaming man who had spent all of his time injuring himself, busting out of everything that they had tried to use to subdue him. This person who was running in the, the graveyard, in the mountains, all alone, who was unfit for society. Mm, the first thing they saw was that he was sitting. He was seated. <laughs> he was calm in his body. That obviously was not the case before. He was clothed. Yeah. He had clothes on now. He, he didn't. Wasn't his habit. <laughs> he had clothes on now. And he was normal, just like them. This in his right mind, that's basically what it means, is he's normal. He, he fits in with society. He, he doesn't stand out in any way. He's not uh, what he was before. The result... It surprises me, but it doesn't. It scared him to death. They were used to this crazy, demon-possessed man who they had no way to control. That didn't scare them. But Jesus casting out those demons and this man suddenly being normal, being just like them, it frightened them. Those, verse 16, said, and those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. The pigs died, and now the man has his life back. That's, that's what happened. But their, their testimony, their eyewitness testimony was important here. Now, 
when they heard this, when they understood what had happened, verse 17 says, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from the region. There's fear and then there's fear. We fear God and, and reverence his power with awe and respect. We are in awe of who God is, much less what he does. They were terrified of this power. Now, I think that it bears, bears telling that this was the center of worship for Artemis. One of those gods, one of those other gods, right? Who, according to Paul, was no god at all, but... He was one of these other gods, and this was the center of his worship. They knew this God. They understood this God. Now, one thing about this God, he had no power. The thing about their God is he didn't have expectations of them. The thing about the God they had created is that no matter what they did, eh, they might get in a little trouble, but there wasn't any real answering for what they had done. They saw his power and they were terrified. They couldn't be in his presence and they didn't know how to remedy that. We see Jeremiah who was in the presence of God in a vision and, and he could not stand to be in the presence of God. Here they are there in the presence of God. They cannot stand to be in the presence of God. Anyone who is in their sin cannot stand to be in the presence of God. God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. So if there's darkness within them, and they recognize that darkness in the presence of holiness, they recognize this power in the presence of this, this God who they did not know, but this was a powerful God. And they were, they were scared to death. Verses 18 and 19 says, And he was getting into the boat, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with the demons begged him that he might be with him, that he might go with him, that he wouldn't leave him. <laughs> Verse 19 says, And he did not permit him, but said, Go home. To your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. He was begging, uh, other translations imploring. He was suffering. The, the American Standard and the King James say he was just pleading with Jesus that he could follow him, that he wouldn't leave him. He didn't want to be separated from Christ. Once you come to know Christ, once you understand the power of God, you want to be close to him. Why wouldn't Jesus let him? Why didn't Jesus say, well, hop in the boat and let's go? Well, he was a Gentile. Uh, back in Jerusalem, they weren't ready for this. In fact, even after some time had been taken, some things had been established, and they should have been ready, they still weren't ready for this. They were not ready for the kingdom to include the Gentiles yet. Another reason was he could be used best right where he was. These other men, these Jewish men who were with Jesus, could go to Jerusalem, could go into all of Israel and later a lot further, but they could go into all of Israel and be very effective there. It's like the, the method that they use in Ghana and in a lot of places. Rather than having missionaries who come in or are sent there, they train up men from there and they go and they spread the message. Well, this that's what exactly what Jesus sent this man to do. He said, you go to tell them, ah, the Lord, Jehovah, the master, 
Tell them what he's done for you. Share the good news. It was their introduction to the true and living God. This God who is powerful enough to do everything and caring enough to do anything for us. So they needed this introduction. They didn't have the old law. They didn't come to know God through through the old law or anything, they needed an introduction. And this was, uh, it was a powerful introduction. In verse 20, it says, but those that, oh, verse 20 of chapter 5, and he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. How much he had done in the great mercy, the grace of God. That's what he was preaching. His testimony was his message. What had happened to him was his message, and his message was effective. The people marveled. Everyone marveled because they knew who he was. They knew where he'd been. They knew how he acted before. <laughs> Paul was also one who's whose conversion story was a powerful testimony because they knew who he was. They knew how he was. They knew how he acted before and who he was after. Coming into contact with Jesus has that effect on all of us. Some lessons from the first half of Mark chapter 5 is the Gentiles were ready for the good news. The Gentiles were ready to come to know God. And we can also deduct that the Jews were not, and it wasn't time, but the Jews were not ready. We also learned that Jesus cared for every single person he came into contact with, no matter what this other person looked like, to the rest of society. No matter how, what kind of outcast. In Mark already, we've had him eating with tax collectors and sinners. And now, uh, now he's hanging out with a demon-possessed Gentile. It didn't matter. Jesus cared for him. And he came to die on the cross for his sins. And yours and mine. In Luke 8, we learn about, I mentioned before that he was, he was naked, and that's where it came from, is Luke 8, and in his account, he, he says that he, his habit was to not wear clothes. Jesus saves naked, crazy people, people who, who run the hills, who hurt themselves, who can't be bound, who ah, are living an existence that looks utterly hopeless. And if he can do that, he can save us. He can save you and me. He can make us whole. He can bring us from that state of, of hopelessness into a state of hope and joy and love. Yeah, we, we all have stories of what God has done for us. They don't all look like this. But Jesus saved him. Saved him from himself. If he was that big of a problem, how much longer were they even going to put up with him? How much longer before they stopped trying to bind him and subdue him and just killed him so that he wouldn't be a threat? I don't know. But Jesus saved him from any of that that could have been coming. And he saved his eternal soul that great torment, that horrible state that he was in is because he was with the evil spirits. For those who refuse to obey the will of God, for those who refuse to submit to the word of God, that chaotic, hopeless, helpless situation is exactly what they're in. I implore you tonight, if you're not right with God, get right. If you need prayers, contact me or any member of the Waterloo Road Church of Christ. 
we will do anything we can for you. But tonight, I just pray that you're doing well, that all the, the hope and the joy of Christ is dwelling within you. I hope to see you all soon and have a great rest of your week and God bless.